to see, uh, to hopefully to achieve that goal? Well, for decades now, Louisiana has been losing wetlands. Yes. Mm -hmm. In other words, losing part of the state. Exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and and is, it, is it your expectation mm -hmm. that, that uh, the loss now can be lessened or stopped or that we can actually reverse and, and recapture some of the lost wetlands? Well, it's a toss-up. Um, I think the most common belief is that the only thing that can be achieved is to, to slow down the process of loss. But there is a technology that might enable us to enhance the, the land, and it has been debated and pushed and argued for, but it has not yet come to take on a force of, of implementation that we would like to see. And it's a very simple idea. Instead of having um, coastal uh, restoration where you have only water, fresh water being pumped from the river into the marshes so that the marshes will grow more freshwater grasses, you actually put your pipe in the river way far down where there's mud. And when the, the water comes through the pipe, it comes through with a lot of mud in it, which is called slurry. Mm -hmm. And then you spray this slurry over the, the uh, disappearing marshes, and you build them that way. Is that, is that a feasible kind of project? It definitely is feasible, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, which would require a great deal of financing, I presume. Unfortunately, it's, it is quite costly. Um, it can be done. Uh, it is done um, when dredging occurs um, it, for any kind of navigational channel. That's, the, that's like, for example, when the dredge boat sits in front of the French Quarter and dredges the river. That's a slurry that comes up, and you can see it if you're on the moonwalk looking at it. When they dredge it, you can see this bubbling mud that comes up. Right. Well, instead of just coming up and being put back into the water channel, you would actually pipe it to, to the location. Uh, what's happening in that regard? Well, um, not enough and not fast enough, and sort of to give you the answer. Carrie St. Pei, who is the director of the Baratari Terrebonne National Estuary Program, is a very strong advocate for it, and some of the scientists are as well. But we haven't seemed to be able over the last couple of decades to really build the momentum that we have needed to move forward sufficiently on the coastal restoration. It just hasn't budged adequately. Do you need a great deal of support from, uh, from our federal government? Is that where it would come from? It, it would, and it will be a growing amount from the offshore oil and gas that um, royalties that will be coming to us, but the larger amounts will not come until the mid-next decade. Um, and so that will be a, a, an important turning point in terms of resources. When we have the surpluses in the state, as we, as we do when the oil prices are high, that is another means. And uh, our coastal Office of Coastal Affairs is trying very hard to garner those resources to direct them toward the restoration projects. Mm -hmm. Well, that, that mm -hmm. sounds good. Now, mm -hmm. some people blame the, uh, the oil, the drilling companies mm -hmm. for uh, mm -hmm. part of our wetlands mm -hmm. problem. Are they contributing to the oh, problem? Yes. Oh, yes. Definitely. I mean, it's, it's verifiable in, in many ways. And the way that they do is that whenever they need to, to cut a channel, and this was especially true historically when they were exploring on the coast as opposed to offshore. Every time a channel is opened, such as Mr. Go, for example, the Gulf Outlet, yes. um, whenever there's a storm or so winds blowing from the south toward into the, the marsh, salt water is forced into those areas and it, it, it kills the, the marsh plants. Mm -hmm. Well, mm -hmm. Shirley, so far, uh, I've been sort of asking questions mm -hmm. about things that were of interest to me, but I haven't given you the opportunity mm -hmm. to talk about some things that you think the listening audience uh, mm -hmm. should hear about. Okay. Well, go ahead. <laughs> well, I'd be happy to. Let me sip a little water here. I think there's uh, a couple things I'd like to expand on that from the questions that you've asked. and. One of them has to do with where the uh, disaster science is today with regard to um, enhancing the safety of communities. Um, there is a new, not a new word, but a word that is now the, the in vogue, the vogue word, and it's called resilience. Community resilience, community resiliency, sometimes it's used that way. It's akin to the concept of, of a sustainable community. Um, and as it's been described, is you think about a community that is um, that experiences a disaster or a catastrophe, okay. and what you um, 
you come up with is an, an assessment that a resilient community is one that is able to, as they say, bounce back after an event. It's recognized that when a community bounces bounces back, it's not necessarily exactly in the same form that it was before. And you've lived through Katrina here in New Orleans, and so you know we are a different community. Um, so the goal of the of the scientists, the applied scientists, is to ask how can a community become more resilient so that it can bounce back. And we're working, for example, with the community of Jean Lafitte right now on that. We're, we're con conversing with the community members to have them tell us what their resilient qualities are in the hopes that as they think about what they've done well, they will imagine how they can do it even better. And so the that, people at Jean Lafitte mm -hmm. did have great losses, did they not? Yes, they did, both in uh, Katrina and with Ike. There, many of their homes have been flooded. What we're doing, though, is we're modifying that idea a bit here, and we're, we're, coming, uh, we're developing a term called essential resilience. And what we mean by essential is that a truly resilient community is one that has a stable, healthy, and I don't mean in term, terms of health, but stable, healthy community with regard to economic resources, with regard to trust among different groups within the community, um, a good quality education system, a good economic base where you have uh, occupations of decent salary instead of just entry-level salary, and that if you have an economically resilient community, in, as I've just described it, mm -hmm. and a socially just community, when a disaster occurs, the community will indeed be resilient to that disaster. But those qualities that you described, mm -hmm. it sounds, at least in my opinion, that the city of New Orleans falls short on each one of those attributes. Yes, that is the case. What can be done about that? Well, you see, when you, when you refocus your thinking that way, you sort of put the disaster research on the shelf and you really talk about your basic social and human needs, human rights, as opposed to civil rights and, and the social justice, you know, qualities of a community. Uh, well, what is the difference between, between human rights and civil rights? Well, historically, since the civil rights movement, we have been focused on violation of, of the rights that have been um, passed as laws within our society. And it's principally, of course, focusing on the African Americans and the challenges that they experienced and the battles that they fought to overcome that. Um, but when Katrina struck, it became very evident that the challenges were even larger than those that were on the books as laws. So, for example, the challenge of the lower income residents coming back to their homes is a human right not only a civil right. And when the public housing developments were fenced in and the residents, former residents of those developments were not permitted to even go back to get their, their belongings, that's yeah. a human right. Shirley, we have come to the end of our program. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you very much. It's been a privilege to have you here with us. I want to thank you folks who are uh, watching our show for being with us one more time and uh, we look forward to having you here again. Shirley, that time went very fast. It did, didn't it? Yes. Mm -hmm.